2392. I think we're here. I think we're ready and we're still signing in. And hey, ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at members of the board and some hardcore supporters. <laughs> A little smaller group than normal of the Central South Coast Longtime Astronomy and Telescope Club in California, your Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. And this is the SBAU Astro Hour underway. It's a weekly online live vlog using Zoom, focusing on the latest space news and discoveries out there, some cutting edge cosmology, hardcore astrophysics. And featuring some of the brightest minds I know, most knowledgeable people I'm proud to be associated with in Santa Barbara, California. And I uh, don't include myself necessarily in that. But I tell you, I ran into a guy named Warren Bitters who just signed up again for our club. He's a longtime member. He says he watches this show, but he watches them later because we archive the Astro Hour. And we're on the way. My name's Ron Heron. I'm vice president, at least for another month. And we'll see if we get revoted in coming up. Uh, in December. Uh, meanwhile, watch us online. Uh, we'll see if Bruce Murdoch joins us in a minute. Um, quickly, let me tell you what we're going to talk about, and then I'll introduce you to the guys that do the talking. Got a dark sky. Let's uh, find Uranus. It's going to be like a visit to your proctologist. Uh, episode 143, <laughs> November 13th through the 19th, by God. And uh, we're going to check out Mercury, which is next to the new moon that just filtered over. And we've got a blinking planetary nebula this week to chat about. We have a uh -huh. lot of this. Yeah, gentlemen. We're going to focus on the passing lemon comet, give you some fascinating pictures. It's coming by right about now, as close as it's going to get. Introduce you to a new one as well and update you on an asteroid named Dinkinish. Dinkinish. I swear I watched a children's program growing up called Dink and Edge. <laughs> in any event, let's meet Jerry again. Jerry's the man in charge. Jerry Wilson, president. How are you? Good morning. And Good. he's married to a lovely lady named Pat Forgy, and she's a supporter and member. And doggone if Tom Whittemore is not with us, at least the top of his head, you might want to adjust your laptop screen or whatever. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my God. <laughs> Get the children away. Uh, Bob is uh, editor of the newsletter for our club, former science instructor with Westmont College and is married to Maureen. Here, Lord Levaduck is Tim Crawford, resident lens and telescope expert. Tim, go with, there your we go. Is, is your real name Tom? Yes, it is. <laughs> but you go by Tim because there's too many Toms. It's, it's, also it's, a Tom's it's, it's always a surprise, especially in banks when you're sitting there and you're signing your name Tom and somebody walks in and says, hey, Tim. <laughs> yeah, that, that only happens after you take your mask off, Tim. Yeah, right. <laughs> and how's your wife, Karen? <laughs> She's just fine. She's finally <laughs> over the crud. All right. Well, it was good to see you on Saturday night. You were working. Bruce Murdoch is uh, being heard, or has he joined? Are you there, Bruce? He's working on it. He's trying. <laughs> he got his name on screen, and he is married to Bonnie and is a longtime supporter, telescope enthusiast. Uh, also president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. Uh, outreach guy Chuck McPartland, very essential to the club, is not here today. He's on assignment checking out global warming. In the meantime, boys and girls, let's have some silliness to get things going because uh, <laughs> President Jerry likes to forward half a dozen or so. We got almost that many uh, cartoons, silly science stuff. Science cartoons are us. Here they come. Because he's in charge. Oh, this is my favorite. A kitty cat cartoon. Definite living proof, ladies and gentlemen. Dead proof, anyway, of the old adage. Um, <laughs> scientists, so beware, because this could happen to you. Curiosity kills cats. Uh, the <laughs> thing in the Far Side cartoon, notice all the computations, theoretical <laughs> scribblings, and lab equipment, uh, Inspector Norm. Yep. Curiosity I love, killed. I love the one with its feet straight up. <laughs> I guess we all like cats. I don't have. <laughs> it's like your graduate school party to me. <laughs> all right, throw up another one. These are silly. Okay, this would be uh, Earth's final alien abduction. It's not a cat, but certainly <laughs> these guys are going to have a baptism by stink. I guess extraterrestrials. If they have the sense of smell, they're in for a big surprise. One says to the other, Earth's final alien abduction. Now I'll just take this probe and <laughs> go up the rear end. Okay, here is the cuckoo clot from hell. 
<laughs> Sick and tired of daylight saving time. Comes out, goes, spring forward, fall back. I can't keep up with this. Pick one and leave it, all right? It's in Congress, I think. Someday, now this is interesting, terrifying, terrible terraforming Mars. You'll certainly weigh less, might eat more, and go there and be springy. It's the greatest diet in the world. Someday we may be able to terraform Mars, it says, allowing humans to be miserable on multiple planets, not just... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I like this one. Oh, crap. It's a uh, headline. It's... Uh, it's, actually, it's a scene from the old uh, Raquel Welch movie where she wore a fur bikini. Remember that? A million years B.C.? Mm -hmm. uh, they're fighting, and oh, my God, here it comes, spouting a lot of words. A giant reptile says, you know what, gentlemen, you're inept. This is disadvantageous. I propound you to all vamoose with great importunity. And the guy says, oh, my God, it's a thesaurus. <laughs> Not only that, but a thesaurus rex, I might add. You know how you can yeah. tell that it's a thesaurus? How? It's by its pronounced gazetteer. Isn't saurus the Greek word for terrible lizard or one of those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's it doing on a book of words? Saurus. I mean, you know, you just tie on anything. A mother-in-law and Sor a thesaurus. Oh, oh, here we go. This one I didn't see. So apparently we're... <laughs> One of our guys are getting off. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I did see this. They've uh, landed on the moon or landed on, on some planet, I guess. The surface is softer than we thought, and he's half buried and still sinking. <laughs> before before Apollo 11 landed on the moon, they were, or before anything landed on the moon, there was a lot of speculation if it was just one giant sea of dust that you'd sink right into. Yeah. yeah. A quick a quicksand planet. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, there's so many planets out there. They're describing them totally made of gold, totally made of diamonds. You might find a quicksand planet that'll just swallow us up the minute we land on it. Uh -huh. and, and those ice moons, I don't know how we're going to settle down there. It's got to be done without. Oh, it's solid. Air. It's solid ice. I know, but it'll still melt, won't it? It's really cold. Bruce, welcome back. I introduced Thank you. I you know, Bruce. decided to do a software update while I was trying to log on. Well, you're welcome back. My God, thank you. So we got a good crowd and we're missing Bruce. Or not Bruce. Bruce is here. We missed you for a while. We're missing Chuck and Pat. And uh, elections next month. Here we go. What are we talking about here? Is this uh, the visit? Aha. It's going all the way out to uh, the, the new thing you just added, isn't it? It's Dinkanesh. Yes. We had a picture uh, last week of um, Dinkanesh and its satellite, and now we find from another angle up there, the Lucy mission is found that the satellite has, or the asteroid has two satellites. And in the first picture, one was hiding behind the other. Where did you get this picture? Um, off a website. Okay, so there's from, two uh, little NASA ones. Goddard. On the right is a satellite of Dinkanesh on the left, right? Okay. Yeah, this is Dinkanesh here. This is Dinkanesh here. This is the original shot they took. And this shows the path of Lucy going by Dinkanesh right here. And this shot was taken when it was looking at the closest approach to the uh, satellite. And this is what it saw. And then later, in looking back, it was able to resolve what was hiding behind right up in about here is where the other... Um, asteroid or the other asteroid moonlet is and so looking back this is what they see an that asteroid was only two taken moons. about five seconds later yeah it was re yeah lucy was really hauling well what's it doing a grand tour of the asteroid belt yes is it it's in in the orbit with the asteroids they're only about it a million is, miles. It's no, it, it it aims for the the these asteroid orbits are well documented and well known, and so it aims right for it. And, and as it passes by on its way to the next one, it takes a picture. They're all flybys. It's not planning any more um, smash them and run. Because unlike those scenes you see in Star Wars, where they got to navigate through a field of rocks, they're all about yeah. a million miles apart, average, aren't they? Now, there's a point about physics for this, and that is, to abstract a little bit, 
that all of this is done with Newtonian mechanics uh, developed in the 1660s. There's no nothing about relativity or quantum mechanics here. This is all um, 1600s, 17th century science. And yet that science has been replaced by or expanded on, not replaced, expanded on by modern quantum mechanics and expanded on by modern relativity theory. But that doesn't take away from the accuracy of the Newtonian mechanics. It just adds into other realms where uh, there weren't observations at the time. So science doesn't move on by replacing an, an old theory with a new theory. It augments the old theory. It just adds on to it and extends it. Hmm. Now, they take into account now the pressure of light. And, uh, you know, Einstein's uh, the precession of mercury, they, they finally figured that out, too. Yeah. The presentation that uh, myself, Farshad Barman, and uh, Ed Klasky gave, what, I guess three years ago now, um, uh, where I simulated... 39 bodies in the solar system by uh, numerically uh, evaluating the differential equations. I was able to uh, match uh, NASA's numbers to 17 significant, significant figures. It was right on. Yeah. So this puts to rest the idea that science always changes, that it, when it finds a new theory, it means the old theory is wrong. That, that's not true. The new theory augments and extends the old theory. The old theory is still right in a certain realm. Well, okay. forgive, me, forgive me, Mr. President. You're going to have to rehash the, the thing that they were saying is wrong. I, I missed that part. Oh. oh, it's nothing about this that's wrong. But you hear on public media, a lot of people say they don't like science because science always gets it wrong. They always have to come up with a new theory to get it right. And that's uh -huh. an incorrect view of science. That's like the, on Saturday night, I told people that, that Saturn had 146 moons. And when I was young, it had nine. <laughs> you know? well, I think yeah. it's up into the 170s now. Really? Wow. <laughs> well, they're trying to throw out the Big Bang Theory based on the latest photographs from the web. And, and I don't know if that's a big moment like uh, Galileo. No, they're not, they're not trying to throw out the, um, the Big Bang Theory. They're, they're not. arguing it. I see so speculation now in some that. papers that there's a second Big Bang. A second? Yeah, yeah. yeah they've seen the dark dark the age of the universe. Huh. It's now 26.4 billion light years old. Well, 26.4 billion years old. <clears throat> well, there's different theories coming up about why there's such big galaxies that far away, that early. In Those the are different hypotheses. When they figure it out, it'll be a theory. Oh, okay. They're testing a lot of these wild ideas. So we're not like the Catholic Church back 500 years ago and Copernicus and Galileo came to us. We're okay. Yeah. Can you blow no, that? Hopefully, hopefully when someone disagrees with you, we don't burn them at the stake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's look at the night sky. The moon is... Did you have something else to say, Bruce? No, no, no. I, had, I just said the... Uh... Latest estimate on the age of the universe, I think, is 26.4 billion yeah. years. I've heard a lot of speculation on that, yeah. They keep jumping back and forth. Yes. Can I There's comment one theory? Can, can I, I say one thing about the double, the, the three three rocks we just saw? Uh, Dink and Nesh is the big one. There yeah. are two little, two little ones that are sitting together. They, obviously, they, what, orbited each other for a while until they connected? <laughs> These two are actually in contact with each other, but yeah. they're not one body. They're just two bodies leaning on each other, and they're both in orbit um, around a common center of gravity, probably maybe even inside Dinkinish. But, but it's pretty small, too, so it might be outside, and they're rotating around a common center of gravity. Yeah, right. And so we've already established that uh, asteroids can have little moons or moonlets, yeah, I've always wondered why we never see even smaller moonlets around moons. And no, this... we might we may find some. I, I'm, you know, the when we collected the sample from um, the one that just landed back on Earth, um, when oh, we oh, scooped yeah, right. up the samples from the surface of the asteroid Bennu, I think 
That is right. We, we knocked loose a lot of pebbles and rocks, and depending on how much velocity they picked up, some of them have es escaped freely, but some are probably in orbits around that that uh, asteroid. And, and all those rocks and sand that managed to coalesce together and form a, an asteroid, that I understand, but a solid rock, I can't yeah. see being formed that way. If solid rock has got to be a piece of a larger body, like a planet that exploded, it would have to be, wouldn't it? Yes, it, it is. Those are called, diff they come from a differentiated body. That is a body that got, was so big that it got hot and all the heavy elements then became became fluid and they moved to the center of the mass and the lighter right. elements moved out to the outside and it it formed metals and rocks and then it was hit and spattered and the outside was knocked off or the whole thing was just broken apart. And that's how you get rocks. So might it be possible that the whole asteroid belt used to be a planet? Uh, no, it hasn't. The, its proximity to Jupiter has... Uh, kept it from forming into a, a single body. Jupiter's tidal forces keep tearing it apart. Oh, but are most of the asteroids solid rocks, like the remnants of a planet or a large body? No, I, I, I don't know the population distribution, but I the demographics of that. But my own suspicion is that most of them are loose gravel piles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. All right. Makes it difficult to hit one with a nuke and, you know, move it over. Well, just hitting them with a probe would work. And they proved that with, what was it, DART? DART, yeah. Yeah. We ever have to. And there are some coming this way. Okay, you can go back to the night sky and we'll uh, check out Uranus. Okay, this is looking at um, what's coming up here in the night sky. Since we have darkness, the... Um, the new moon occurred this morning at 1.27 a.m. And so we have, tonight, we have as close to a dark sky as you can get in in this area. Clouds not, notwithstanding. Yeah. We Jerry, is, is, is this about 7 o'clock tonight? Yeah, yeah, this is 7 o'clock tonight. So this yeah. is the early evening. Um. This time in the summer, it would be another hour till dusk, but now we get real good darkness. Jupiter and Uranus are prime targets tonight. You, Jupiter is the brightest one up there, and near it is Uranus. Also, the Pleiades and a number of nebula. It's a good, rich region. It's in Aries, the ram. Jupiter, I mean, Uranus is at magnitude 5.7, so it's not a visible eye object, not naked eye object. It's um, You're going to need a binoculars to see it, and better yet, you're going to need a telescope to scan to find it. Oh. I, I thought in the talking points that you said Uranus, you could see it in a real dark sky? Naked in eye? a telescope, you can. Oh, okay. But uh, 5.7, um, I don't know anyone with eyes that... The astronomy magazine claims that it's the edge of naked eye visibility, but for me, it's in the dark. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, our, our club had another record second Saturday star party two nights ago. Tim Crawford, you were there. Is this how the sky pretty much looked up through those oh, trees? Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's why. That's why I guessed seven o'clock. It was. It was like this. We had about. We had between four and five hundred people show up. And I I even left early. I was sitting there greeting for a while, but it's three hundred fifty-five. Is that right? So between yeah. three and four hundred. And right yeah. above us was Jupiter. I guess we always miss Venus because of the trees, but that's all right. Uh, we uh, Venus, well. Venus, Venus is a morning. morning. Uh huh. Yeah, and Venus that. is a morning object. Morning. Oh, mornings these days. All right, yeah. and then. Saturn was hot for at least three or four scopes were focused on the rings. What is this? Pleiades. This is a picture, a picture of the very nice picture of the Pleiades. It was posted on Facebook by a, a friend from uh, Budapest named Erica Zeline Rosa, <clears throat> who posts a lot of astronomical pictures and, and local pictures around Budapest. She's quite That's a, a good wonderful photographer and an amateur. 
<clears throat> she did not take this picture. Someone else in that she knows took it. That's fabulous. <laughs> it's a very nice picture. Yeah. Is uh, Budapest somewhere near Budapest? It's on the Dan. <laughs> what, what did he ask, Jerry? What's that? What did he just ask? I couldn't hear. I, him. I, that was a, a play on words. Uh, people mispronounce yeah. the name of that uh, uh, state or whatever you want to call it uh, as Budapest. It's Budapest. Yeah. That's correct. I, yeah. I had a, we had a Buda, guy at work that uh, was. And, yeah, uh, the, the cities of Buda and Pest are separated by the Danube. Uh, yeah. Okay. But now they oh. are Interesting. But the S in uh, uh, their language is pronounced like an SH. Mm -hmm. We had uh, one of the guys that worked for us, PhD, was a, uh, his name was Milos Makachek. M I L O S is pronounced Milos. Right. Okay. So the, the this pronunciation <clears throat> gets really bad for, uh, for example, the worst case I've come into is this uh, country of Austria. Um, mm -hmm. There were people in a um, bed and breakfast that I met at breakfast one day that was from Austria. And mm -hmm. a fellow was asking him where they were from, and they kept answering him, and he didn't understand it. Because Austria is not Austria to Austrians. It's Osterreich, which, yes. means, <laughs> okay. which means Eastern realm. Right. And, yes, what, so, hmm. and what is Deutschland? Germany. means Germany is yeah. Deutschland. How about Czechoslovakia? and Slovakia? They were once one country. Now they're back to Czech Republic. Oh, well, once two countries. They got shoved together as one in an hour or two again. Yeah. yeah. Well, the best history is Hungary. The oh. um, When the Huns came and invaded, uh, started to invade Rome, Rome bought, bribed them and bought them off by giving them a large tract of land. And the word for land in, Hungar in Hungarian is Gary. So the Hungary is the Huns' land. Oh, wow. and it used to include Kosovo and and Bosnia. And I lost track of all that in the '90s when they had a war that broke all all the things I learned in high school up. Remember Marshal Tito, the yes. dictator back in the '50s of all of those countries. Anyway, hey, wonderful fellow, huh? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> up there with Papa Doc Duvalier. Aha! Uh -huh. Oh it yeah, is. there Dictators it is. Are us. Okay, where are okay, we now? This, this is uh, up in the sky, mm -hmm. overhead, right. in the right. evening. This is Cygnus the swan. Mm -hmm. This is the tail of the swan. It looks like it should be a hawk flying this way, but it's actually a um, goose going this way, or a swan. They're kind of geese going this okay. way with the head up here at Alberio. And it is in the Milky Way. That's this light blue band here. And it's chock full of all sorts of uh, our galaxies, clusters and nebula and clouds and dark nebula. And the one we're talking about tonight is NGC 2826. And I think someone in the crew here said they saw it last night. Or Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We Was got it? that Saturday okay. night. And the, the star hop to this is really, it's a clever one and very difficult. The blinking nebula. Was it blinking? Planetary. Yes, it, it does, uh, Ron. It's a... Let, let Jerry talk mm -hmm. about it, and he'll explain. Blinking planetary, okay. What? It's not variable. Variable applies only to stars. No, right? the trick of your eyes. Ron. Our eyes yeah. are variable. Okay. Rods versus cones. Yeah, your eye, the center of your eye and your cones is not very sensitive to um, uh, dim light. And so it takes a lot of light to tr trigger it. So if you look at it very directly at it you don't see it very well but if you look off to the side then the rods on the side of your eye they're more sensitive to dim light and all of a sudden it appears to pop into view right increase in bright a thousand times more sensitive to dim light yeah so this applies. one's right on the edge of that transition and sensitivity between your rods and your cones and that's what gives it that blinking effect that's right yeah. that's right that's right. That applies. That applies to most stars up there for me. I have to look off to the side <laughs> before it comes you, alive. You know, Jerry, if I can interrupt, the the, the end of the wing there, the, the star at the end of the wing, and if you draw kind of a line from sixty eight twenty six through that, you're going to see another brighter star off to the right, and so that one right there, 
So how I hop to it is I use those two stars and I go out equal distance. And you look in the in your in your eyepiece, there's two brighter stars in the field. And you take those brighter stars and look around, and all of a sudden you'll run into kind of a fuzzy dot. And that's 6826. Yeah. It's a really hard star hop. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't you put an O3 if you put an O3 filter on, that will greatly increase the contrast with the background. Oh, interesting. I'd have to try. I'm going to try that. But you don't yeah. have any close-up blow-up pictures of it? He does. He does. Or is that coming here? Yes. Okay, that's it. A huh? little blue spot. Fuzzy yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it Which doesn't... are the two stars you were talking about being close? This one, or is it the one there between? Uh, it's in the field. No, it's in the field, and it would be more like out at about... I don't know if those are the ones, but there, there's two that are significantly brighter. If you were to go up to like 11 o'clock where the two gold stars are, it's much like those. Yeah, see above to the right there, there's two stars close together. No, no straight above that. Just go straight out from uh, 6826 through the gold. And oh. go. There's two star, stars close together just above that gold star. And it's like that, but they're significantly brighter. I don't know if they're in this field of view. I don't think they are. Okay. They're going to be outside this field. But Yeah, this is a fairly narrow field of view. Yeah, if you were to look at the two stars that are just above that one gold star in a straight line, there's there's two stars close together. They're going to they're going to actually look like that, but they're much brighter than any two stars in your field. And you take okay. that as your indicator and then you kind of look around. It's kind of look like looking for the sombrero. You look at that arrow and then mm-hmm. and then you can find it'll point to the It'll point to the sombrero, but in this case, it's a difficult hop. It really is. Well, can you update me on planetary nebula? Is this a close-up shot? Are there stars yeah. inside the nebulas? Are they? This is. Star- there's white one. Dwarf. White yeah. dwarf. Oh, this is this is a shot of the blinking nebula from Hubble. Wow. Okay. Well, what are we looking at? What are the red? There's things? there's the central white dwarf. Okay, it's and just, all this crap is the outer layers of the white dwarf, and it's shaped by the motion, rotation of the white dwarf and uh, local dust and stuff. Tom, oh, I just say that was kind of a technical term. I think it's nebulosity, isn't it? Crap is a technical term. Yeah, <laughs> you know the, it, it, Ron, uh, the 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 planetary nebulas. They're kind of a star like the mass of our sun, at, and it's at the end of their life. And what happens, they kind of run out of fuel, and they kind of start sputtering out and burping off layers of gas. And this becomes a shell of gas surrounding a central star. And that central star shrinks up to become this white dwarf in the middle there. And that ultraviolet light from that, it fluoresces this shell of gas. They all have that in common. Okay, but th- we're not we're not looking at a former supernova, kilonova, or no, hypernova. No, 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 no it's nova. Different, different it's a dying, the dying star, Ron. Just like our it's, sun will be. It dies. It's a, lot, it's a smaller mass star like our sun. Right. And so, with the end of their life, they create these, and like we would become something like this. Yeah. Oh. Hey, Jerry, would you do me a favor and go back to your original chart of Cygnus, please? That one. Okay. Um, I swear that in the image that this person uh, took of 6826, there's a galaxy over on the right. I was just trying to find it in this thing, but it must be too darn dim. So if you go from this to uh, your image, that one, look over in the far right, everybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a galaxy there. Yeah. You mean this fuzziness? Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's a galaxy. But to, I, I don't know huh. the scale set. I don't know the scale set on Yeah, this. we don't know. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have an M number. Yeah, this is pretty tight because it is a narrow field because you can see the central part. This is where Hubble is, and you can kind of hint at the structure it shows. Yeah. There's yeah. also another bubble of mass around here. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. You can just barely see it in the picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you're pretty. We're pretty tight in on it. So the fact that's that you're out. So, so yeah, that's probably an icy yeah. galaxy, is my guess. You know, so Tom, hold on. The, the generation of that nebula is quite violent, and what you have, all stars are a balance between two things. 
the mm-hmm. nuclear fusion that's going on in the core is sending out radiation that's pushing the star, trying to blow it up or balloon it, get it bigger. It's rushing out. And gravity all the time is trying to crush it in. And, it, and the mm-hmm. star's alive, so to speak. There's a balance between the two. Suddenly, the fusion stops. And now all of a sudden, there's nothing to resist gravity. And the, the star, as outer region, is in free fall. And it slams down into a core, crushing the core. And then the outer layers bounce off that new core. And that's where you get this material coming out. But that's also done in a nova, isn't it? No. What you just, what you just no. described, it collapses and then blows up. and then yeah, well, it's, 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 that's that's nova, This did not on. blow up. This bounced off. So that's like ultimate solar wind or stellar, stellar wind. All of them are sending out particles as well as light, right? Just yeah, like so our sun. Ron, you got to be careful. When you, know, when you say nova, that implies a companion that uh, may give a little bit of extra of its atmosphere to the star, okay, causing it to go into, you know, a little burst on the edge, but not a blow up. It doesn't blow up. But it gives hey. these peri- peri- uh, aperiodic bursts often. Sometimes they're periodic, but more often than not, they're aperiodic. And then they go away. And then sure enough, something happens and you'll see them again. You know? What are they What are they calling what's about to happen any day now at Betelgeuse? Is that going to be a supernova, hypernova? That be, yeah, that, that would be a supernova. That's, that's an extremely massive star. Does it have but, a companion? Is it a binary? I don't know about that. Jerry, do you know? I don't think so. Yeah, I, I don't think so either. Um, okay, well, I'm just trying to dis- differentiate between novas and what we're seeing here. I'm yeah, this is about. really neat. To, I mean, whoever took this image is just phenomenal. I mean, th- there's a galaxy out there on the right. Yeah. And, and it's so one way to remember them is Nova. Even a, it's not bright enough to be an NGC. It's probably an IC, an index catalog galaxy. You were saying, Gary? Oh, one way to remember it is Nova is a Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jerry, when, if I can make one last comment, this mm-hmm. you, what you said earlier about the blinking planetary was really true. That's there's a balance between the central star's uh, brightness and the shell, and mm-hmm. that allow and what this little blinking on and off, this switching on and off because of our eyes, not because of the star. Right. right. It, it's 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 this balance. And, and Tom, when you and I were up at Lake San Antonio uh-huh. uh, a few years back. There was a fellow up there that uh, that I went and asked uh, someone, did, did, are there more of these in the sky? And he said, well, you're really lucky. This guy that wrote a lot of I- information about this is here mm-hmm. tonight. And he took me over to his scope, which was at the end of a big ladder, about 18, it was, it was about an 18 inch. And we went up on the ladder and he started uh-huh. showing me a bunch of these. I he see. said, there's a ton of them in the sky, but they have to have that, that balance of the brightness for you to see that central star. For instance, with the ring nebula, you just you're not going to see that central star right. too dim, unless mm-hmm. you have a big scope. Yeah, but, the the ring nebula of the central star is 14th magnitude. Yeah, people, but Jerry was right. An eight inch scope easily, I can. My 11 inch scope really brings it in. Oh yeah. wow! But as often as not, when a star collapses and it loses what half of it goes out into space, the rest of it you would think wouldn't be enough to make a black hole or a white dwarf but that's what happens isn't it no it is a white dwarf i know but most of the stuff is already gone it's what we're seeing in the the round part there well white dwarfs the uh nuclear reaction is not present it's just a cinder that's cooling down yeah it's just coasting okay yeah you're seeing the ashes run of what used to be a sun-like star that's it that's it and they're very very dense really heavy and and very very hot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is it about a hundred thousand kelvins typically? You know, oh, so they wow. they, brought, wow. they broadcast beautifully in the UV, the ultraviolet. Okay, interesting. I didn't know that, Tom. But is it possible we could have this phenomenon without the white thing in the middle because it's already collapsed down to a black hole, and therefore no, it the- will not become a black hole. It's not massive enough. No, and I don't think the event horizon would allow you to see this shell. I just don't think that would happen. Aha. Uh-huh. Fascinating. Nebula. How many different kind of nebulas are there? There's a planetary. What else? Uh, is there another word beside planetary nebula? 
Diffuse Nebula. Diffuse Reflection. Yep. yep. Reflection Nebula. Emission. In, in fact, that image that Jerry showed earlier of the Pleiades, that beautiful yeah. image that was from Hungarian Lady, uh, shows the Merope Nebula. It does not belong to those stars. It does not belong to the Pleiades, but these stars are passing through that area, okay? And they're showing their hotness and their blueness by reflecting off of the gas around. Okay, they're just passing through, Ron. Okay, the Pleiades in in, in mass, you know, as a group. Okay, so uh, well, we discussed it's the most beautiful. The Merope Nebula is one of the most beautiful things you can we, see. We talked before. about this before. Planetary. The word planet has nothing to do with it, right? No, no. It's just that when they were first seen, the they they were kind of green and everything. And so people thought they were, you know, pl like a planet. Yeah, oh. they mimic they mimic planets. That's oh. right. That's right. That's okay, got it. And here we go. Well, this should be the, the planet, or not planet, but a comet called C2023 H2. A real lemon, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like a I'm going to grab some more coffee. Lemon. I'll be right back. Okay, so... Who took this picture, Mr. President? You? And if uh -oh. not, why not? Why can't you take a picture like this? Any of you, why can't you get a shot? It's like, who did we lose? I you think Jerry vanished, Ron. I think we're on our own here. Uh-oh. Let me refer to what he said us. I just wrote down a few of the notes. It's passing the closest to the Earth. Mm -hmm. so now's the time to get a picture of it as we wait okay. for our beloved president. It's going okay. within... Um, 0.19 astronomical units of Earth. So, wow. like, did, this, uh, did, did Jerry mention what constellation it's in? Uh, Hercules. Okay, okay. So it's in the western sky at best now. Yeah. Just below Vega. Or, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Magnitude six. Is that seeable with the naked eye? On the edge, on the edge, Ron, but now, now you're kind of facing the glow of the setting sun, so binoculars will definitely help. You could probably catch it in binoculars. But, what you know, to Jerry? But okay. The, the it won't have that nice tail in your binoculars. It might look like a little fuzzy. Did so Jerry you guys that put your... You guys that put your telescopes out on a regular basis look forward to the new moon, right? When the sky goes darker, especially in you the know, fall. Yeah, you know, I, I'm more, if you like, a binocular person. I love exploring binoculars. I think you really learn the sky better with binoculars rather than that intensely focused view with a telescope. But no, I, I do uh, bring out a small refractor or I have a, an eight inch telescope I built some years ago. It's, a, it's called a richest field telescope. Uh, it has a field of view of around three degrees at about 25 to 40 power. So it's just amazing. It's real fast. It's what we call fast optics. I have did Jerry, did Jerry crash, Ron? Or did... Yeah, I think he did, Tim. You could yeah, see him fluttering. Every so, every so often it warns him, and he didn't have a chance to tell us he's about to oh, go. Okay. And he'll, he should join us again. You know, okay. can, I, can I just say just for a second, you mentioned, Ron, that you ran into Warren Bitters, and he watches yeah, this. Wow. And Warren, Warren Bitters, I, he came up to me on Saturday night, and he said, Jim, oh. do you remember me? And I said, sure. Yeah, you know he he has a really nice astrophysics scope, yeah. and uh, and you he know, killed he, it. Yeah, yeah. Killed you it. know who also showed up was Andy Allen. Now Andy oh, Allen, wow. okay. Andy Allen is back from yesteryear, and he got it. We got a chance to talk because I just finished this eight inch scope. Well, Andy had an eight inch scope that he put together, and the mirror on that thing was to die for. He had a yeah. uh, he had a helical. Uh, focuser on it. One night we just trained our eyes on the trapezium in, in Orion. Mm -hmm. And on a good night, you can see not four stars in the tra trapezium, but six. Yeah, the, that's the a good night. Stars. His scope, you could just clearly see the E and F stars, and we were struggling to find them. So he had he had put together a really nice scope. And yeah, I think one of the things that added to it is that the, the night air can really affect your your um uh, or heat can really affect your mirrors mm -hmm. on a reflector so yeah. he had put a he had put a, a fan below and above his mirror so he really got rid of that air and, and it brought that mirror to equilibrium but I mean, he just killed it man we could you could really yeah. see a lot of stuff in it and tom yeah. what did they tell him he had a 20th wave on that 
Oh, yeah, it was an awfully good mirror. Again, he didn't make that mirror, but he got, uh, I, I forget who did make that. But it, Warren Bitters and Andy Allen remind me when I started the workshop, the mirror making workshop that you were in. That's okay. right. And That's Warren right. was in that workshop. He didn't, he had, he had a family. I thought you know, he brought his daughter to it. So he kind of disappeared. Uh, Andy was in the workshop. I don't remember if he built a mirror because he ended up with that super eight inch that he built a scope around. Oh, that, was, that was unbelievable. And he had a smaller car. So what he did is devised a way of taking a sonar tube, which is, you yeah. know, Ron, those are the, like those concrete, concrete reinforcement uh, tubes. But yeah. he cut the thing in half and he somehow made it so it would slide together. Yeah. So he could fit it in a little tiny sedan and take it out and expand yeah. it out and start looking at this guy. He was just killing it with that. Tim, you know what they call that? You know, Tele telescoping a telescope. Telescoping <laughs> a telescope. It was a fabulous scope, man. I'm, yeah, it's it, it, really it, nice. It's it really nice. And it's the helical really focusers, Ron, they're the kind that instead yeah, of you turn. turning the knob and, and turning the knob, you know, you, you twist the whole That's unit. Right. And when you twist it with his, you could twist that and really feather in the, the focus. Yeah. I might yeah. add, since, well, since, until Jerry gets back, another good scope that I've been really jealous of lately is this guy down below here. I'm seeing is Bruce. He was out, he's out been out there at Westmont a couple of times with his explored scientific eyepieces. And he'll say, Tim, take a look at this. And I, I'm just going, oh, my God, is this the same sky I'm looking at? <laughs> it's unbelievable. Okay, well, these four scientific scope. eyepieces have just phenomenal contrast. Oh, it's, it, your, in your scope, it's just balanced so nice. I think we we're looking at a globular cluster. And mm -hmm. Ron, for, for you, the globular clusters, they're just like a big snowball of stars. There mm -hmm. we go. He's coming back. Oh, good. Okay. okay. There we go. Hey, You're welcome back. back. Those bathroom breaks time. are great, aren't they, Jerry? When you got to go. You must be taking diuretics. I'm. I dropped my pillow. <laughs> <laughs> Those bathroom breaks, but we handle it quite pretty well. Kicking things around here, people we've seen recently and building their own. Yeah. Scripts. you're back. So I found out that um, I just got. A, I've called each one of you, uh, <laughs> except Bruce. I just got to Bruce, but uh, then the computer came back on. Oh, so, okay. That, you're I all on direct. Way so, out in the other room, but I didn't. You're all on direct to recording. Yeah. None of you answered your phones. I silenced mine, so it doesn't. Yeah, mine's, mine's in another room. Yeah, in another room. yeah, mine was in another room, Jerry. We were talking about seeing Warren Bitters and, and yeah. Andy on the other night, and then talking about uh, Bruce's scope with these Explorer Scientific eyepieces, which were uh -huh. just fabulous views of like globulars that he had. Out at Westmont, unbelievable. Of course, yeah. this Friday, Bruce, we, we're going to get lucky to even be there. <laughs> and, yeah. and just for the record, Andy Allen, you also mentioned him. He was there. He's one of our younger members, as far yes. as compared to us. He's well, he goes be... way back, Ron. He, he goes way, way back. I, I'd yeah. say 2003 easily when uh, well, I joined. If he gets elected, he's the only one running for secretary in the coming December elections. The man is incredibly sat right next to me at the last uh, uh, meeting of the first Friday, a couple of weeks ago, took notes of Professor Povich's speech on stage. He's taking yeah. notes. <laughs> he's, yeah. a, he, he's very, very capable young man. Yeah, yeah very likable. capable. Good. I think we've got a great election coming up. If Jerry and I survive, we uh -oh. lost him again. Oh, yep. no. I was going to say when he was he, when I when I met Andy, um, we I'm had just the, moved here, and I started here. I started doing the newsletter, and Andy was the secretary. So at that time, we had to swap roles. Um, you know who was going to do the printing, who was going to take care of the printing, and so I remember Andy coming over to the house in early two thousand and six, and at that time, Andy worked out at the Galita Library. Okay, so really, uh, yeah. No, I, I think he's in tech now, you know, but uh, he was at the library. Um, well, I've been in the club six or seven years, and I hadn't met him until just recently. And yet, Oh, he, no, no. He, he's been gone for a bit, Ron. Oh, you know? okay. Then he just came back. R really yeah. really uh, smart. Well, uh, yeah. Tom, I'm trying to put together. I know I got time with you because you yes. went to the end of the month to release the newsletter, and I'm trying to get – a photograph now that I got all three of them, two on two of them are online. One of them I have an actual picture in my wallet. Mm -hmm. 
that I want to send to you, but I got to get Tom Totten, our former president who used to run this, our webmaster, to put him into a little one column by two inch thing for the newsletter. Are you, did you get my, my, uh, yeah, I can also squeeze images. Don't forget. Okay. I, oh I, yeah, I, sure. But yeah. Uh, I sent you a caption just in case I can't get the pictures to you. That was Jerry on the phone and he's going to try to get back with us soon. And he said, in the meantime, we'll just chat it up. So, yeah. Well, he's he's the man that sent up. He's our webmaster on this, or our master in control. Yeah. He, world, are we still on the screen if he's not a, on board? No, no. He just says chat it up, and he goes, "We'll, we'll be fine." I wanted if if you won't, if you guys want to keep on talking about telescopes, fine. But if you want to go back to the Pleiades, I can. We can ask Tom and Bruce a little bit about that Pleiades because that is one beautiful yeah. object. Yeah, well, yeah I need to put a second reducer on my scope to be able to get the whole thing in the eyepiece. That's yeah. hard. One thing I was going to do, you were talking about the contrast. You know, the eyepieces have a lot to do with it, but um, Charles Schuler and I go out a lot, and he always uh, is just wowed by the contrast that I get in my scope. And, you know, his scope, which is a, a Dobsonian, uh, doesn't have enough of a shield up in the front to keep stray light from coming in and bouncing off and coming to the mirror. And yeah. I mentioned that a couple of times. And uh, one of the things that I've toyed with in mine is, you know, remove the corrector plate, which I've done before. You have to be very careful and, and mark everything. But uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then paint the inside of the uh, OTA uh, with, uh, they have some ultra black paint. It, it's 99.9% .9 absorptive. Huh. And, Interesting. And see if that helps the uh, improve, even improves the uh, contrast more. Oh, Bruce, I'm telling you, the, the images that you had out there, of the, I was looking at the same images. Of course, I don't have, what is yours, 11? And, I'm as a C11, right? And, and, and I have that 8 inch. And, and looking, I'm, I'm looking at the same targets, and I'm not going to be that far off on contrast, but yours was just incredible. I well, mean, the next dark time we're out, you know, I did this with Charles Schuler, and he went bonkers. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll let you. Well, I'll let you use. Minutes. I'll take my. You have a two-inch eyepiece, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll let you put my uh, my twenty-millimeter uh, Explorer Scientific, hundred-degree field of view. Don't don't uh, do that, that Bruce. One. Don't do Pardon? that because I looked at the price. I don't want to look at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the cheaper one. You know, my nine-millimeter is so at thirteen hundred dollars. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can make a couple of telescopes for that. <laughs> I gotta you tell you, Bruce. With you, so you might as well enjoy it, Bruce. Tom, like, you looked at the. You looked at the. Uh, as I remember, you were looking at uh, what is it? M forty five. M forty two. The forty five. The is the Pleiades. Forty five is the Pleiades. Oh 40, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I was looking. Yeah. And you were looking at that, Tom, one night, and you said you could see the reflection nebula in the in the eyepiece. So, I, yeah, easily. easily I, I I would I don't know if I've ever been able to see that, it, mm -hmm. it, but that that would be beautiful because you know what it looks like, Ron, is it looks like kind of a bluish, yes, uh, kind of, and it, it's it's almost like a it's almost like the you know spikes on a star. And it'll go off from a brighter stars in the in your in your field. It'll kind of like emanate from those. It's you're really about, pretty. You're talking about the Pleiades now. The Pleiades, right? Well, yeah, I think it's more talking about the uh, Maroki Nebula. You know, basically yes. the, the gas that the, the gas that the Pleiades are actually moving through. Okay. See, I, I could you can see the Pleiades pretty well with a naked eye, and I grew up thinking that was the Little Dipper with a two star Every, head. Yeah. Everybody does, and at, at every star party that it's up, they're going, oh, look at the Little Dipper. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, chances are these last three things from Jerry's talking points will be moved to next week, but let me see if any of you know about it. There's another sure. passing comet. It's called 62P Shushanshan. T-S-U-S-C-H-I-N. It's named after some Eastern, Russian. I don't know, Arab or whatever. It's in the Beehive Cluster, M44, up in Cancer. Does anybody know anything about the other comet besides Lemon? I read I read about it shortly, but it just kind of went in one ear and out the other. And okay. I get in. Well, we it, can wait it, for Jerry. But, but being in the Beehive, I suspect that it's going to be at a time. I don't know when that's going to be up. After, or, mid, after midnight okay, now. Okay. 
So right, well, we could we it'll probably be up there for a while, and maybe we'll move it to oh, next yeah. week. Oh, yeah. back. Yeah. Uh, did yeah. you read up on heartbeat stars? Macho 80.7443.1718, but it's a binary system mm-hmm. in the large Magellanic, Magellanic, uh, Magellanic cloud. Yeah, right. okay, that, that's in the Southern Hemisphere, but I, I, I started reading on that, and I wanted to hear more from Jerry on that because I, that sounded fascinating. I don't know if these are pulsing stars or what. Well, it's in a constellation I don't know if I've heard of. Dorado? Is that Dorado, the, yeah, it's a flying fish. That's in the southern. Oh, okay. It, we can't so, see that, here, Ron. It's, no, they're all in the southern hemisphere. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, here's something we can talk about. I'm sure the Leonids are coming our way this Friday. Mm-hmm. They have uh, the happy meteor showers to us. The radiant is uh, up in Leo in the head, mm-hmm. and the crescent moon will set about 10 p.m. It'll be filling up, I guess. About yep. 10 meteors an hour. And uh, not very Get stunning. But some people like to lie out on the grass in the cold, I guess, in November. That's the mm-hmm. way to look at it. That's the way well, to look can, at it. You certainly don't set up a telescope for a meteor shower. No, no, no. Well, the no. nighttime temperatures have been below 50 degrees here, like 48. Here was where? Where do you live, Bruce? I live near the ocean in Isla Vista. I live 200 feet from the ocean. Really? It's yeah. colder, colder there than up in the foothills where the other guys live? <laughs> no. Well, well, Saturday Saturday night, uh, Saturday night, Joe Doyle and a few other guys uh, went up up to um, uh, Figueroa Mountain, and he had uh, predictions that their temps up there were going to be 51 degrees, and that ours at the museum were going to be 41. And I don't think we were even close to 41. At least maybe there was just a lot of body heat around us. With 350 people around you, you don't get that cold. (laughs) <laughs> well, very often when we went up to the gun club, we'd get an inversion. It'd be cold down here, and up there it'd be balmy, seventy-one yeah. degrees. Or yeah. So yeah. he, had, yeah, I, I think that he said it was pretty nice up there. They had a, they had some, they had some really nice viewing, and some strange thing that I don't know if I can talk to. I wish I, I wish he, I had him here to talk about it. They, they all witnessed uh, what like a UFO type thing. They, they saw something uh, in the vicinity of Vandenberg and it looked like he 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 kind of said it was like a balloon and uh the something emanated from the balloon kind of spun off from the balloon and several things were uh spun off from those and then and then the the balloon object blew up oh. so they, they were talking about what that could be uh, Joe just texted me I don't know if he's watching or not but he just texted something we may but, have our uh, president joining us here again. I see our oh, logo. That, that'd be good. Uh, I'd love to bring up a little bit of meteorology here, if you don't mind. Is this coming no at all. Is this coming week going to be the start of our monsoon season? Because I, I don't see anything, any indication, maybe some light clouds today. When, when they said This morning they said on KYT, like Wednesday, we're going to have some rain, and then Saturday. But whereas like the Weather Underground is predicting Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and even Saturday, so that's why I say that we have a we have the Westmont College Star Party this Friday. I don't think it's going to happen, right? But well, I'll I'll contact you, Tom. We'll we'll touch base on that. Chuck McPartland told me Saturday night that probably the next three outreaches over the next week or so, one of them being uh, Westmont, are going to be canceled. And I said, "How can you say that? It's a clear it's, sky. It, it's coming. It's coming. All right. It's, well, we can the, use it. Yeah, and the uh, uh. The Westmark deal. We'll see about that. There were several people that night, uh, at this past Saturday night, were asking about these star parties. But a lot of people want to know when. When do these things happen? And I told a lot of them about Westmont. I said, "You want to come to the second Saturday at Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, and the third Friday at Westmont College, and those are all free and they're really nice. Westmont's really nice, giving them an additional warning that if you go to Westmont after seven o'clock." Don't go in the lower gate where the kiosk is because you won't get in. You have to go to the main gate, which is further up, because otherwise you'll just be sitting out there in the line waiting for that gate to go open, and it won't. Yeah. The I'm last thinking- time I did that, I figured, okay, we're screwed. And I uh, I drove in, and there was actually somebody in the kiosk, even though all the gates were down. They're, they're manning it now. Pardon? They're manning it now. 
Yeah, and I said, uh, I'm with the astronomical unit. And they said, fine. The game went up, and I went in. Yeah, but By they the way, might I looked at weather.com, <laughs> and on Friday the 17th, they're talking 66% chance of thunderstorms. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, I'm sorry, 66 degrees, 69% chance of uh, thunderstorms. Yeah. So, so the, you know, we, we I don't know how many stars we'll, we'll be able to see. <laughs> hey, probably somewhere near zero. Yeah. A lot Those of are the movie since, stars out there. Since the Westmont Telescope is located right there next to not one, but two sports fields, you must yeah. have a light problem like you wouldn't believe. Oh, yeah. They always they want to know how to get there, too. And you tell them, that, I don't know if the signs say observatory or 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 baseball field. There's a baseball athletic field. field and there's I think a track. Call it. What is it called, Bruce? Athletic field. Athletic field. Okay. Is it is it just one? I, I, they play football or soccer on one field, and then there's a baseball field next to that, right? And yes. Yeah, there's two fields, one on each side of the uh, where we set up at the observatory. There's there's no would... hill. There's no hills that you could set an observatory up on in in the middle of Westmont. Westmont's all flat ground. Um. It, it, they just put it where they put it, and and there oh. just happens to be trees around. There's always trees around wherever we have a star party, and it's I always get like the chainsaw. Huh? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. That's why my latest scope is so nice because I can pick that thing up really easy and move it, and it, it and it, it's a it's a nice feature, you know. But some of these guys like Chuck that he sends up that he's got a new nice uh, mount that made by astrophysics called a Mach two. And it's what forty-five pound mount, and once he gets the legs and everything on it, you don't want to move that. You want to, they're going to be staying where you are. You well, know. also he goes through an alignment process that gets him very, very accurate, and yep. then it's a go-to scope. He says, "Go to here, go to there," and it goes and it goes over wherever you want. Did you hear that? Have you heard his mount, Bruce? It's so quiet. It is. It's not the same quietness. It's well, you haven't heard my mount move. Both of our mounts uh, use. Uh, Tooth rubber belts. They don't have any gears in them. Huh. Other, than the, other than the worm gear that drives it in uh, uh, azimuth. All right, whatever, uh, right ascension. Uh, huh. I got to tell you, Bruce uh, Murdoch, uh, one interesting thing about you, I don't know if it's ever been observed, is that you pay particular attention to not one of your senses, which is your eyes, like we do, looking through lenses, but also your ears running the Theater Organ Society. You get some incredible concerts in the Arlington, don't you? Oh, yeah. The The unfortunate thing uh, with the change in management of the Arlington and whatnot is we do a, a open console once a month, typically the second Saturday of the month, but we don't get approval from the theater until the preceding Tuesday. So I can't put it up on our hotline, you know, our dial-in phone message. I can't put it up on the web until Tuesday. Yeah. Th- those are your monthly meetings, aren't they? Well, more or less, yeah. Okay. And are they well attended? Do they you ever well, fill in? You know, when we got a couple of times that we've been uh, uh, have a notice in the independent, and then we'll get 50 people coming in. And one of the questions we get a lot is, well, how long has this thing been here? I said, we did our first concert, October 1st, 1988. Well, does the organ that comes up out of the stage have not one, not two, but three complete keyboards? Or four. Just four. Whoa. It's actually got seven. It's got seven keyboards, but uh, both the lower two keyboards, which are called the accompaniment and the great keyboard, have second right. touch. You can play a, a, a push a key down. And it feels like it stops. And if you push a little harder, it'll go over center. And you get another registration you can set up. Uh, yeah. Also, we have a, a switch on the sw- one of the swall shoes that uh, is called the soft genudo. If you, you can hold a big cord on either of the bottom two keyboards. And with your foot, turn that switch on. And then take your hand off. And the cord continues to play. So then you got your hands free to go off and do something else. And then you got the foot pedals for the real low pipes. Oh, yeah. The pedal board. There's actually two pedal boards. There's one on, you know, the, the pedal board has second touch also. Every so often on YouTube, I just call up Box, Toccata, and D, and just turn it up as loud as I can, and I wish I was hearing it in Arlington or one of those. I big... used to be able to play that all the way through, but I haven't done it so long that I, I'm rusty. Oh, it's incredible. It's 
19 different themes you know <laughs> Bach was on high on something the day he wrote that for the church Let's he wrote see. that when he was I think 19 years old or something like that I wouldn't be a bit surprised with some of those yeah. prodigies Listen, we're down to the wire. We might as well close things out and, and promote what we're doing. Uh, I guess you're going to be battening down with the coming rain, the latest atmospheric river. And when that goes away, uh, we'll see if we get more, you know, between now and when does it end? The monsoon reason, uh, season is over in January, February. It just rained like hell 10 months ago, didn't it? Oh, it, it's hard to predict, Ron. Yeah, well, if we get another one of those, it's it'll keep the lake cold. Had a yeah, fellow maybe. I knew that was a, he worked at sea and he was telling me that one of the things he noticed is if you have early rains, it's going to kind of be a dry, a dry season. But he said, okay. if it's not raining real early, look out. Well, you forget, right. the full, you forget the full names of the months. May, oh. May gray, June gloom, July Man. no sky, August the foggiest, September <laughs> to remember, you know. Yeah. I'm not a crazy about bright sunshine i like it when i don't have to squint on my daily walks just enough cloud cover you know but it doesn't do much good for you guys at night i know uh coming up is uh the not one not two but three 20 minute little in-house members only speeches for december 1st when we <laughs> gather at the fleischman auditorium even though most of us would love to be back at farron hall you you think you like it more intimate back there in the back where the third of a house in the Fleischman pretty much at least halfway fills. And anyway, we're not going to go there. We're going to meet again online next week. Okay. Very with good. Our, with our president, take care of yourselves. I guess we'll just click off the little X in the upper corner and be back for number 144 on Monday. The, uh, what is it? 20th. I think it is next Monday. Thanks. Sounds, sir. Good. Sounds good, Ron. All right, guys. We'll talk to you later.